This is the MyHeart.net podcast. This show is produced by Dr. Philip Johnson in conjunction with VitalEngine.com. Please welcome your host, Dr. Elaine Bouchard of Cardiology Specialist of Birmingham, Alabama at St. Vincent's Medical Center, part of Ascension. Welcome to our podcast on LVAD. And with me today, my co-host is uh, Dr. Mustafa Ahmed, Director of Interventional and Structural Program at UAB. We have also Dr. Jason Guichard, who is an advanced heart failure specialist with Prisma Health in South Carolina. And uh, our special guest today, an incredible surgeon uh, from Australia, Dr. David McGiffin, who's director uh, of the heart surgery and cardiothoracic surgery program at the Alfred Hospital. So gentlemen, welcome into this podcast. And this is actually very nice because here we are, Sunday afternoon, beautiful afternoon in Birmingham. Uh, it's dinner time in South Carolina and it's breakfast time and Monday morning in Australia with Dr. McGiffin. So thank you very much for taking the time, making the time to discuss LVAD. So uh, David, I'll start with you. Can you explain to us, we talk about LVAD as a uh, uh, mechanical circulatory support system. What, what is LVAD? What, what does it stand for? And, and how should we explain to our patient what an LVAD is? So an, an LVAD or left ventricular assist device is a form of mechanical circulatory, circulatory support that really arose out of cardiac transplantation, the number of patients who were dying on waiting lists. Um, and the, the, the history of, of um, ventricular assist devices used as a bridge to transplantation has a very interesting history. Um, but the, the Circuitry, the circuitry support community always knew that ultimately the goal was a permanent replacement device that would that would replace transplantation. Now that's we're not sort of quite there yet, but um, but the the role of ventricular assist devices in um, many countries like Australia is primarily as a bridge to transplantation or a bridge to decision. Um, I just want to put a caveat on these terms. There is the terms bridge to candidacy, bridge to transplantation, uh, bridge to decision, and destination therapy. That is patients who are going to receive an LVAD as the final therapy for because one for one reason or another they can't have a heart transplant. I, I think we've got to be a little careful with those intention to treat uh, uh, definitions because the the reality is people move from one of those, may move from one of those intentions to treat to another because of the dynamic nature of heart failure and its treatment. Uh, and I think we should really get rid of those terms uh, and because those terms are really sort of regulatory terms because we should just use, we should just have an in, there is an indication for a, a, an LVAD, yes, no. I think that's how we should be looking at it. And then a patient may be ultimately going to a heart transplant or maybe going to destination therapy. Now, destination therapy, of course, is widely used in the United States, but not used in Australia um, because uh, uh, patients in Australia getting an LVAD have to fulfil the criteria for bridge to transplantation. Now, that's ultimately going to change, but that's the situation at the moment. Um, now, the ventricular assist devices had, as I mentioned earlier, had a very interesting history. They started out with these pulsatile devices, which had numerous complications. Uh, they were in very, very large devices, uh, and a lot were extra or paracorporeal devices. That is, the pump was actually outside uh, of the patient. Um, but the whole situation of VADs changed when continuous flow technology came along because nobody knew could you live without a pulse. Uh, and then it was discovered, well, in fact, you can live without a pulse. Uh, but we've created this whole new physiology of continuous flow and pulseless patients without a pulse. And, the, and there are some downstream consequences of that, but, but it is possible to live without a pulse. We've actually 
this is sort of an anti-evolutionary trend. You know, for 700 million years, we've had, uh, we've had a pulse, uh, uh, you know, and now we've, now we're becoming anti-evolutionary uh, and uh, by taking the pulse away. Uh, so there've got to be some downstream consequences of not having the pulse. But, but anyway, the pulse, this, this continuous flow technology is wonderful technology uh, and has uh, enabled many, many patients to get the transplantation who otherwise would not be able to be transplanted. They would have died before, prior to it. And there are patients now who uh, have LVADs and living very well for many years with these devices. So um, obviously you're ta talking about the tandem heart, which was the pulsatile uh, I mean, obviously, LVAD has been going on for at least 20 years, but it seems like the evolution of it is progressed toward the HeartMate or the Heartware LVAD, which is now being used um, these days, isn't it? Yes. Uh, the, the continuous flow uh, pumps, uh, the HeartMate 2, Heartware, and the latest one is the HeartMate 3. Um, and the one that we use at the Alfred is almost exclusively the HeartMate 3. So just to get into this a little bit further, uh, and Jason, to pull you into this a little bit. So the the reason you need a left ventricular assist device is because your left ventricle, the main pumping chamber of the heart, is failing and cannot no longer meet the body's needs, correct? And so has the, how's that been over the last... 20 years or so, how's that evolving now? At what stage, um, when, do you, when does the LVAD conversation begin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, a good question. So, you know, heart failure is a progressive disease. Um, so people are usually have a, an index hospitalization, you know, with heart shortness of breath, um, dyspnea on exertion, lower extremity swelling, where the heart failure is initially um, diagnosed, <clears throat> then medical therapy has started. Um, various device therapies if needed, um, and patients can usually follow kind of three trajectories. Um, one trajectory is getting better, which thankfully in this day and age of medical therapy is the majority of patients um, with all the, the medications in our tool belt, which you know, some of them we've talked about on a previous podcast, including the SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, some patients don't really improve, kind of stay the same, um, kind of linger a little bit with uh, you know, doing okay at home, um, but still a little limited, especially with exertion. Um, and then you have a, another group of patients that uh, don't do well with medical therapy and, you know, sometimes even unable to get out of the hospital, even with that initial hospitalization um, due just to the weakness of their heart. Um, you know, there are some red flags that we look for, um, you know, with worsening heart failure for patients that would technically meet criteria for LVADs, kind of a simplified mnemonic, uh, which is often used um, um, kind of in the heart failure world is uh, I need help. So the I stands for inotropes. So inotropes is a IV medication that helps the heart pump to kind of classic inotropes is medicines called dubutamine, medicines called milrinone. If your heart is requiring an IV medicine continuously infused in your body in order to, in order to work, that's obviously a red flag. You know, so these patients are very high risk. Um, and would be, you know, candidates for um, what we would call advanced therapies as a umbrella term for incorporating LVADs um, and uh, heart transplantation. The second, which would be N, which is NYHA class. So usually NYHA class three or four. So these are very symptomatic patients that are unable to um, go up hills, go up inclines, um, you know, are very, very um, symptomatic with exertion, unable to do normal daily activities. Next would be E, so the I need help, E would be end organ dysfunction. So people that have worsening renal function or liver function, these are all high risk features of a weakening heart. You know, obviously the heart provides, you know, um, flow to all the organs. So as the other organs begin to have issues, you know, that's all kind of indicative of worsening heart failure. Next would be another E would be um, very low ejection fraction, usually less than 20 to 25%. Um, which is a one of the um, important um, reasons for getting an LVAD. The D is defibrillator shocks. So if you have a device and you are having lots of VT and VF, so ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation, those are high-risk features for a weak heart. So that would be something 
to think about. Next would be hospitalizations, H. So one hospitalization in the last 12 months um, or greater than one would be a high risk um, feature. Next would be uh, edema or escalating diuretics. This is the, um, another E. So if you're requiring high dose diuretics to keep the fluid off you and we're having to constantly increase medications to get you better, that's a high risk um, marker. L is low blood pressure. So if we're unable to get people on medical therapy or on medications to help their heart, you know, that's a high risk marker as well. And then P, um, prognostic medication. So you know, unable to titrate medicines to their gold doses are all high risk features. So basically just describing someone with a, a weak heart um, that we're unable to use with medications or unable to improve them with medications, the next step in that process may be either LVAD um, or a heart transplantation. So um, just to be clear, I mean, the LVAD obviously is not an artificial heart. I mean, what is the difference you know, between those two? So an artificial heart is where the heart is removed and replaced by a pump, which is usually a pneumatically driven pump, although there is uh, being under development now um, a continuous flow uh, total artificial heart. So there's, so there's two, uh, two impellers, one for the left side and one for the right side, incorporated into a single can. So that's under development. That's called the bivacore. Uh, but the artificial heart... Uh, is a pneumatically driven pump, uh, at, but but the but other, unlike the LVAD where you keep the native heart in place, uh, the artificial heart requires the ventricles to be removed. So basically, we have a device, the LVAD, that really kind of helps the left ventricular, you know, the the heart, the pump, the main pump. Jason has described a patient population that really is needing help. How do we how do we know whether um, you know this patient you know will evolve toward a transplant or or whether whether is a candidate or not for a transplant? What a, what kind of criteria do we have for this? Or how do we decide whether this patient would be a good candidate to stay on LVAD and and, and live with LVAD? How do we make these decisions? Yes, this is a. Um you know, a, a very important question that all um, advanced therapies committees, you know, VAD and transplant committees, you know, kind of struggle with. There are some kind of rules of thumb, um, so to speak. Some of the um, easy ones are if someone is, um, you know, transplant, you know, you have to be on a waiting list based on blood type and other, and other markers. Sometimes the wait can be long. Um, as we know, these patients can be very sick. Um, and if they can't wait long enough for a heart transplant, that would be an easy indication for uh, an LVAD because um, you obviously don't want someone struggling or dwindling away um, and then they're too sick for a heart transplant um, and, then, um, um, uh, and then not be able to get the therapy that they need. Some additional things, uh, at least in the U.S., um, to kind of decide uh, between transplant or LVAD would be the indication that Dr. McGiffin talked about, which would be destination therapy, um, also called a bridge to life, which is kind of a more um, politically correct a way of saying things. Um, these are patients that will be on LVAD as permanent therapy. So for one or more reasons, um, they are not a uh, heart transplant candidate. Some of the big things um, are age. So at least in the U.S., um, there are some cutoffs, some age restrictions. It varies by, by a transplant center. But generally speaking, the 65-year-old age um, begins to be um, kind of a, a cutoff for some transplant programs. Um, other issues would be um, ability, you know, other systemic illnesses. Um, so patients that have bad lung disease, um, bad kidney disease, or bad liver disease. So other um, organ dysfunction that could be prohibitive um, for transplantation. Sometimes these patients would be eligible for, for LVADs. Um, and then, of course, as Dr. McGiffin was saying, the, the group of patients that are bridged to candidacy or bridged to decision. There are question marks with regards to um, some of their uh, evaluation. Um, so at that point, giving them an LVAD as a bridge to decision or bridge to candidacy will give you time to evaluate this patient fully um, in order to uh, determine if they would be a candidate for transplant or not. Let, let me just e extend some of those comments of Jason. Um, and, and this is a little bit country dependent too, because we don't have destination therapy in Australia. 
So once a patient gets an LVAD in Australia, um, they will they retaining the VAD as a long term option is really by default because once you get a VAD in Australia, then you are listed for heart transplantation after you've recovered from the operation, uh, unless there is some clear uh, contraindication to transplantation. Uh, and that's that breached candidacy uh, de- uh, intention. Uh, and that is, uh, then there are times when we put an LVAD, is, LVAD in when we're uncertain whether the patient will be transplantable or not. Uh, and if um, if uh, a patient subsystems don't recover after the VAD, then it, by default, it's uh, that patient is in, is so called destination therapy. Um, the cut age cut off of sixty five, of course, is chronological age, not biological age, uh, and we will uh, you know occasionally transgress that limit uh, age limitation. Um, uh, and uh, I, I, I should say probably the older, the, the maximum age for a VAD or transplant is the age of the head of the department, by the way. But we will transgress uh, 65 uh, for uh, patients who are biologically uh, much younger than that. The other thing that will prompt us to move fairly quickly to transplantation uh, would be complications arising from VADs. VADs are not free of complication. Um, and one of them in particular is uh, VAD in driveline infection and VAD infection. That really demands listing for transplantation. VAD infections are, for all practical purposes, not curable. Uh, there, there, there are reports of people being cured, uh, but I think there'd be very substantial publication bias there because there's a lot of people where these surgical procedures are tried but they're not successful and we can come back to VAD infection uh, in a minute if you like. Um, The other issue is the right ventricle because remember we're supporting the left ventricle and we're relying on the right ventricle uh, to uh, function uh, not normally it'll it does not function normally but function adequately that's all you that's the best you can hope for the problem is that the right ventricle uh, is uh, it, 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 the right ventricle really, when an LVAD is put in, undergoes these changes in shape, which make it much less efficient. Uh, and progressive right ventricular failure after an LVAD uh, either requires a VAD to be put in on the right side or for the patient to undergo transplantation. So going back on patient selection, the patient population we want to address, I mean, obviously, particularly when we think VAD, we think transplant. Um, But I know in the U.S. there's over 100,000, you know, people in the transplant list. Uh, There's about, um, you know, one new patient being added every day. And there's about 18 patients, in average, dying every day waiting for the transplant. So is there a way, actually, um, you, you know, are there predictors uh, and, and way to refer the patient earlier to these, to these VAD and, and transplant program? Um, or if you, do you have to wait to have a hospitalization for heart failure? Are there any kind of indices kind of tell us as cardiologists following these patients with heart failure, we're trying to implement, you know, guideline-based, you know, medical therapy, is there something we, we, we could kind of throw out there to say, hey, look, let's think about LVAD or, or you know, transplant when we encounter certain, you know, problem. Uh, just try to bring, you know, the patient, you know, earlier on, you know, to the, the, the transplant team maybe. Yes, I think, you know, most uh, heart failure cardiologists would say that, um, you know, there's never really um, ever – any too early reason to refer someone for advanced therapies, we would much rather um, receive the referral for someone, you know, too early than too late. Because even if the patient is too early, we can still help with medications, help with prognostication, help with a little bit of education, um, and then always send the patient back to the referring physician. Um, So two, you know, thinking about when to refer, it's actually a fairly easy decision. 
Um, number one, it can't be too early. And number two, if you ever feel uncomfortable, um, like if this, these patients, you know, you have that clinical kind of feeling, um, gestalt, so to speak, that, uh, you know, this patient's not doing well, um, that's always a, a good indication. And we've talked about some other kind of hard and fat or some easier um, kind of objective indications with the I need help. Um, but there are various, you know, clinical, biochemical imaging, as well as hemodynamic um, uh, markers for advanced heart failure. Um, we could, you know, go through some of those, um, you know, pretty quickly on the clinical side, cardiogenic shock. <clears throat> so usually someone in the hospital who is requiring um, medications or other mechanical devices to keep the heart supported. You know, that, that's obviously an easy, an easy choice. We talked about hospitalizations. We talked about symptoms, you know, MYJ class, um, advanced class type symptoms, um, inability to tolerate medical therapy, which we know is good for patients, um, rising creatinine or liver function tests or elevated BMP um, are some of the biochemical markers that are, are high risk. On the imaging side, you know, a dilated left ventricle, which is also dysfunctional with a low ejection fraction, um, are always indicators. And then on the hemodynamic side, so patients with low cardiac output, which is just a kind of objective measure of how much blood the heart's pumping, um, uh, are all kind of high risk markers, elevated um, pulmonary pressures. Um, and then of course, the Seattle Heart Failure Model, which is a score, um, you know, a survival of less than 80% at a year. These are all patients that, um, you know, um, definitely need to be seen by a heart failure cardiologist. But the easy answer to your question is, you know, it's never really too early. Um, we love to touch as many heart failure patients as possible to make sure that they're optimized, to make sure that they're, um, you know, have the right prognostication. Um, but then, you know, most importantly, as a referring physician, if you ever feel uncomfortable, um, then that's always a, a good, a good um, reason to refer as well. Uh, let me just uh, uh, em emphasize what Jason said it's never too early uh, and it's very important that a VAD transplant program has a patient on the books, so to speak, so you know the patient. Um, and uh, there are often things that can be recommended by, by a VAD transplant program that will be helpful to a referring cardiologist dealing with heart failure. And heart failure, I'm talking about chronic heart failure now, it isn't, isn't, isn't a sort of a progressive downhill course it, it's sort of stepwise uh, and it's very easy for people to get sort of fooled about the trajectory um, uh, that a patient's really going downhill and it's and they don't quite perceive that that's happening uh, and if a patient's referred too late to a bad transplant program then often options are off the table because of subsystem dysfunction. Uh, so it's very important to get patients to a transplant program, VAD program early. Right. So we've talked about the LVAD. Um, we've talked about the, the patient selection. And uh, David, why don't you tell us maybe um, a little bit about the, the procedure itself? You know, let's say I'm a patient. I need an LVAD. Um, what should I be expecting, you know, coming to your clinic and then as we go on to the procedure itself coming to the hospital. So, so here is a, here is a hardware pump uh, and the components of the hardware pump of, of a centrifugal pump are that's got this inflow cannula that's going to be placed inside the left ventricle to siphon blood through this chamber here where there is a rapidly spinning impeller. Uh, and then this is the out where the outflow graft is attached. An outflow graft is a Dacron graft made of it's like material. A Dacron graft then is attached to the ascending aorta, the main artery leading, leading from the heart. And then there's this this uh, component called the drive line. Uh, so the drive line is um, goes out through the skin and is then attached to a device called a controller, uh, which is like a small computer, uh, and the power source. And the power source can be the, the mains, it could be a, a cigarette lighter, it could be batteries. Uh, uh, so there are a number of sources of power. So that's the basic principle. And whether it's a hardware or a HeartMate 3, uh, 
these are centrifugal pumps, um, uh, uh, as opposed to the axial flow pump, which is which is the Hartmate two. They're all very they're, they're very similar. So the operation is a is an open heart operation, so to speak, in that you need a heart lung machine. Uh, now there are some centres that put these pumps in without using a heart lung machine. That's that's a bit of a tricky thing to do, and I'm not myself. I'm not all that convinced that there's a that that's a a good thing to be doing. Um, but but it, there are some places that do it without a heart lung machine. But we use a heart lung machine. Um, there are two approaches you can use. That is a stenotomy, so an incision up and down the front of the chest, or they can also be put in minimally invasively with a small incision under the left nipple uh, and together with a small incision at the top of the breastbone. Uh, and uh, the patient is placed on the heart-lung machine uh, and a hole is cored at the apex of the left ventricle. Uh, and then that, uh, and then a, what's called a sewing ring is sewn onto the apex of the left ventricle. And then the um, inflow cannula goes through the sewing ring. And then the sewing ring is locked in place. Uh, and it's amazing. The, I've and always wondered the how the cannula, I've always wondered how, the can, how you keep the cannula in such positions. So is, the, is the cannula locked inside the sewing ring or do you? How, how, yeah, is that, so how is that kept in the sewing ring? Okay, it, de it depends which device, um, but you see there's a little hex screw there. See that little hex screw? Yes. Okay, so as soon as the inflow cannula goes through the through the sewing ring, then you just get a screwdriver, there's a screwdriver which locks that, that hex nut. So that's the hardware. Um, for the Heartmate 3, it's a different, it's a different, Sort of mechanism uh, that that locks the sewing ring onto the uh, onto the uh, inflow cannula. Then the graft is brought around the right side of the heart and then sutured to the uh, ascending aorta. And then the drive is is pulled by a tunneler through the uh, through the abdominal wall and usually brought out either the left or the right side level with the um, umbilicus so how long does uh how long does one of these operations take what kind of uh what's the recovery like afterwards and uh, what's the training required to put one of these things in is this are these things only to be done in very few places by people who have done a lot how does it compare to your standard heart operation well it sort of depends a bit on the condition that the patient comes to the operating room uh you know somebody who's um been in cardiogenic shock and been on VA ECMO and a temporary bad and uh, 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 they and, and could be very could be quite debilitated. Uh, then re recovery after this operation may be several weeks or longer. But somebody who let's say has got chronic heart failure, uh, they're referred at a, an appropriate time. They've still got the physical reserves. Uh, they can be. Uh, uh, recover from this operation very quickly and maybe only in the hospital for a week or so. Um, as far as training is concerned, there's no, at least in Australia, there's no formal training program for a VAD, but, but sent the, there are only um, five centres in Australia um, who, that put in VADs, uh, including one, one children's hospital, uh, and so there are very few bad surgeons in Australia, but all of us uh, have had considerable experience. So really, credentialing uh, is hospital-based uh, and uh, really determined by the um, head of the unit. So um, obviously, it's a complicated operation. Uh, we can count on probably four or five hour you know, operation as well as a... Is that is that correct or no? No, I, you know, a straightforward LVAD um, it, it will take probably no more than three hours. Mm -hmm. um, but the issue the issue often is: is the right ventricle ventricular function adequate or not? And that's one of the key decisions that has to be made during the operation. Um, because if the right ventricle is not, if the function is not adequate. 
then you've got to do something about it. There is absolutely no point in sending a patient back to the intensive care unit with a struggling right ventricle because that's not going to work because what happens is the bad uh, flow starts to fall, um, fluid is given, then the kidneys fail, then the liver fails, and it's the patient's unlikely to survive. Uh, and so what we do, and probably most centres do, we use a temporary right ventricular assist device if we have any concerns about the function of the right ventricle. Now, there are lots of ways of doing that, but the way we do it at the Alfred is we put in uh, a temporary device. So we put, we have an external pump, a rot what's called a rotor flow. The one we use is a rotor flow. We put a cannula up to the right atrium through a femoral vein, uh, and then we put a graft onto the pulmonary artery, uh, and then a, and then we bring that out through the chest wall, uh, and we put in a cannula into the graft, and that's the return line from the external pump. And we keep that in for as long as we are concerned about the right ventricle. Let me just re-emphasize, we're not after normal right ventricular function. That is not going to happen. We're after adequate function. Uh, and then when, when we think that the function is adequate, then we remove it. And that's a simple means. We just pull the cannula out of the femoral vein, the uh, access line. Then the return line, we just pull the graft out of the chest a few centimetres, cut it off, oversew it, and let it just retract in so we don't have to open the chest to remove the temporary RVAD. So it sounds uh, like some, some patients require um, like a right ventricular VAD. Um, <clears throat> as well as the LVAD, but how well, frequently does that happen? Okay, so that's that's correct. The patients with the very worst right ventricles uh, may require um, an LVAD plus off-label use of an LVAD in the right-sided position. Um, now, as far as the temporary VAD is concerned, the, the usual sort of frequency that that is used is probably about 10 to 15%. Our use of it at the Alfred is about 30%. And I, and I make no apology for that because we have a very, very low threshold for using temporary VADs because there's no downside to using a temporary RVAD, but there's a lot of downside to not using it when you need it. Um, now, the, the very, very worst right ventricles need, this, need an additional RVAD. You're this patient... You've had your, your procedure, you go back to the room. I guess you should expect, you know, a week or two in the hospital and then probably go to a, a rehab, you know, center. Tell us a little bit, and maybe, Jason, you can pitch in, you know, uh, what goes on with, I mean, obviously, the family. The um, it's obviously life-changing um, for both the positives and the negatives. So we can, you know, uh, talk about the positives first. Um, so we know that there is a significant survival benefit. Um, with LVADs, and we know that there's a significant quality of life um, and functional improvement with LVADs. So the survival with an LVAD um, um, is about, you know, in the kind of the modern era of destination therapy, um, is about 74% at a year. Uh, now compare this to about 25% um, without an LVAD. Um, so very significant improvement um, from 25% to 74% um, with an LVAD. And of course, that's uh, compared to the gold standard, which is indeed heart transplantation, which is about 88%. So as you can see, um, you know, survival is, is definitely uh, much improved. Um, and uh, in addition to the quality of life scores, including six-minute walk, um, various questionnaires are all improved as well. So quality of life, survival, you know, all um, without an argument improved um, over medical therapy in patients with LVADs. Now, I tell my patients for adverse events with LVADs, you know, we've tucked up procedures, um, driveline infections, you know, so the power cord, so to speak, that exits the skin um, is a chance for bleeding and infection. So uh, you have to be careful about keeping that line clean. So that's going to be something that patient and their caregiver is going to have to be mindful of. There's um, mucosal bleeding. So both nose bleeds and GI bleeding um, is a very common complication of uh, LVADs. Blood is made thin with an LVAD. You have an artificial device that the blood doesn't like, so your blood has to be made thin uh, for that reason. 
Um, the next would be pump thrombosis or embolization, um, which was a huge issue with some of the earlier devices, not so much with the HeartMate 3, but something that has to be kept in mind. And with that thrombosis and embolization, of course, strokes are always a big issue. So ischemic strokes from thrombosis. So as everyone knows, strokes are bad. Um, that can be a catastrophic complication from LVADs, including hemorrhagic stroke. So just like the mucosal bleeding, your blood is made thin, you know, your body physiology has changed with an LVAD, so you have increased chance for having hemorrhagic or bleeding strokes. So those are all of the complications or the majority of the complications I've had, even though you're able to be more functional, including playing with kids and grandkids and golfing and sometimes even going back to work. Um, one of the biggest things to talk about is caregiver, um, is caregiver fatigue. Most programs require an LVAD patient or a candidate for advanced therapies to have um, a uh, caregiver, so someone that would be with the patient 24-7. As you might imagine, um, caring for someone 24-7 can be problematic for some, especially if they work um, or have a busy lifestyle themselves. So there's definitely some, you know, relationship changes, family dynamic changes, patient and caregiver changes um, that are all, um, you know, important to evaluate and important to educate and anticipate um, before the implantation of an LDAD. Um, and caregiver fatigue, excuse me, caregiver fatigue is a real issue um, and can be, a, a, um, 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 you know, something that needs to be addressed early um, so as to prevent it um, from happening because it can be, you know, obviously deleterious to both the caregiver and to the patient themselves. So uh, you mentioned, obviously, the medication. These patients are on aspirin and anticoagulation, uh, I suppose, mostly Coumadin. Um, the, uh, a lot of these patients will still need their heart medicine. Um, as well as how about hypertension? How do you measure blood pressure in someone that doesn't have a pulse? Yes, that's a great question. So, yes, more and more information has come out now that we have a longer-term data with LVADs, and that is true. So we have learned that, indeed, continuing medical therapy for LVAD patients actually is beneficial. Um, so sometimes a lot of your heart failure medications um, are continued, which is actually the right answer um, for a lot of your medications. Um, as patients know, these medications can lower your blood pressure. So checking your blood pressure and monitoring blood pressure can be a little bit tricky with continuous flow devices and, and patients that have no pulse. So your blood pressure is um, um, measured by um, healthcare staff that are familiar with these devices and how to measure blood pressure. It's generally done with the Doppler um, ultrasound machine where you blow up a blood pressure cuff um, until the sound of the whooshing sound of the continuous flow device is stopped. And then as you release the pressure, that uh, um, initial pressure where you hear the blood pressure is generally believed to be your, your MAP, or your mean arterial pressure. And that is the, um, the blood pressure of the, of the patient. And we generally like that number to be less than 90. Uh, we've learned that through some studies, um, or it can be somewhat device dependent, but generally speaking, we like a map less than 90. So generally between 60 and 90 um, is kind of the um, you know, window that we shoot for for patients as far as blood pressure management with LVAD. Sounds good. Um, now let's say we're out of the hospital. You know, my patient has had an LVAD. Um, he's going to have obviously many questions. I mean, what is a life with an LVAD? I mean, what kind of exercise can I do? Um, can I have kind of a normal life? Can I, um, can I bathe or shower? Can I travel? Uh, what do you tell them? Yes, I, I would say, you know, we do these things to get people, you know, back to life as usual. Um, of course, there are going to be some, um, some changes, you know, lots of patients uh, go on with their normal daily activities, um, including even going back to work and traveling. Um, there are some, you know, like we said, restrictions, you know, anytime patients travel, they need to identify an LVAD center that they would go to if they weren't having issues. So doing a little bit of homework before you travel is always smart. Um, and generally speaking, um, either your LVAD center or the patient themselves will contact that LVAD center where they're traveling to make them aware that you're you know, present in that area. If there were um, any emergencies, um, you have to protect the drive line. So there is a special way that you shower. Um, in order to protect that drive line so it doesn't get um, you know moist and infected, and of course, as you might imagine, uh, no submersion, um, so no no swimming, uh, no hot tubs, um, and generally it's recommended that there's no 
you know, no boats, although cruise ships are generally, um, you know, believed to be okay with proper precautions and education. Um, so these are, you know, what we always aim is to get people back to life as usual as much as possible. That's the whole reason why these things exist to improve quality of life as well as survival. Um, I know that there was a question about how long these devices last. Um, these mechanical devices actually last pretty much forever. Um, the main thing that would stop them, stop the devices would be either the patient expiring themselves, or if there was some complication within the device, whether that be a pump thrombosis um, um, or something else. But the device, if left to its own abilities um, without any complications, um, theoretically goes on forever, especially the frictionless or fully magnetically levitated devices that have no bearings. Um, there would be really no reason for them to stop. And there are patients um, that are on, have been on LVAD therapy for greater than 15 years. Um, in the absence of any kind of complications, they, they are workhorses. They work, uh, they work forever, essentially. Oh, this is great. So you really can live a normal life, uh, pretty much a normal life with certain, you know, adaptation. Um, you know, you can travel, you can exercise. I have some patients that play golf, you know, with their LVAD, um, they're driving, you know, everywhere. And even they have a normal uh, family life with uh, intimacy. So, um, you know, David, maybe we could kind of look into the future and tell us um, what is in reserve. I mean, what are we studying now? What should we expect within the next three to five years with the LVAD development? Um, so the the goal that the VAD companies and everybody involved in uh, VAD implantation wants to see, and that is elimination of drive lines, so a totally implantable system, so that drive line infections would completely disappear. Drive line infections have a ten to twenty percent incidence, and and as I said previously, they are for all practical purposes uh, not curable. Uh, uh, and the only way of dealing with it is um, VAD removal and transplantation. But living with chronic infection has some serious issues that, that having a VAD infection is actually a risk factor for having a stroke, either a hemorrhagic stroke or, a, uh, or an ischemic stroke. So there are really important uh, consequences of having a VAD uh, driveline infection. The problem with eliminating the uh, drive lines is that you've got to have a very, very reliable energy, transcutaneous energy transfer system. Now that there have there are systems that are being um, trialed now um, experimentally, and one is actually being trialed clinically. And I know of two patients in Europe that have totally implantable systems using the the coplanar uh, energy transfer system so that they have a big coil in the right chest uh, beneath the right lung and then a, an external coil for transducing energy. Um, but there are concerns about the reliability of this system. Um, and the, the, they actually, this system actually has a, has a little external plug sitting on their skull so the system fails. You'd have, you could plug the patient in uh, to external power. So that, that really just demonstrates the, the concerns about the reliability of the system at the moment. So a fully implantable system uh, is probably five to ten years away. Um, there, there is a lot of work being done on much smaller pumps, patients that have heart failure who don't really require a, uh, a durable LVAD, but may benefit from having another litre per minute of flow. Uh, and uh, so these intraventricular pumps that could be implanted potentially percutaneously into the ventricle uh, are, are currently under investigation. So these small pumps, um, uh, could really uh, have a very um, important role in managing heart failure. So I think they're the, they're, they're the, the big ones. Um, one of the issues is about pulsatility. 
um, can we obviate some of the problems uh, of not having a pulse with a pulsatile device? So there are no pulsatile devices at the moment. Now, the, the, the hardware and the HeartMate 3, they have some pulsatility, but that's not giving you a pulse. That's just, uh, that's just some pulsatility to wash the pump. That's there for washing reasons to try and prevent clots. But if a device had a, a pulse that simulated uh, our own pulse, would that be beneficial? Nobody knows. Um, I will say that as terrific as these pumps are uh, and as a wonderful a job that they've done saving lives, um, patients still do not have the same exercise tolerance as somebody with a normal heart or a transplanted heart. They still have exercise limitations. So a question for you, Dr. McGiffin, since you've worked extensively both in the US and uh, Australia, what is it like, uh, what, what's access like to such technologies? Is it, um, you know, what's your thoughts on that? You know, you're obviously over here for a long time and are these things equally accessed by the population? Are they, are they not? And how, how does that look in, in the, the US, the rest of the world? Just what's your perspective on that? Well, there's no perfect, there's no, um, there's no perfect medical system. It's, it, it's, when you talk about which is the world, which country has the world's best medical system, it's it's a case of which has the least worst. Um, uh, and there are, you know, the top, let's say, ten countries in the world that have, uh, in terms of access and quality and cost, if you rank them, um, the, the the access to these sort of devices is equitable and fair. Um, so Australia would, is in the top 10 uh, and everybody in Australia would have access to a ventricular assist device if that was indicated. Now, obviously, that you know there are reasons why some people can't get them because of geographic remoteness and all those, all, all those sort of things that apply in every country. But in terms of if you're an Australian citizen or an Australian resident and you need a VAD, you will get a bad. Uh, thank you, David. The um, maybe we could obviously we we know that LVAD you know prolongs life and, and saves lives and and you can have a pretty good life you know with that actually and and it can be quite long. Um, what is the cost exactly, uh, Jason, in the U.S. and and uh, and maybe you could mention a few things about the cost effectiveness of this technique. Yeah, so as um, we've talked about in previous podcasts, cost is always an um, important part of any kind of therapy, and we openly discuss that. Um, so at least in the, the U.S., um, you know, the cost of that effectiveness of an LVAD is destination therapy or bridge to life. You know, the mean cost of an LVAD implantation is about $180,000. Um, so this is quite a hefty price tag. Um, as you might imagine, in, in, in the total six-year total price tag. So the LVAD implantation carries a six-year total price tag of about $750,000. Um, so, I mean, that is a significant cost, you know, for a single patient over the course of six years. Um, to kind of compare things for a heart transplant patient, um, the 10-year total price tag is about a million dollars. So, you can see LVADs are kind of slightly more costly or significantly more costly than a heart transplantation. So, you know, all of these advanced therapies, you know, both LVADs um, and transplant, you know, carry very hefty price tags, um, you know, which is why, you know, we do a very um, thorough job on the front end, you know, selecting candidates um, because you know, we want to be good stewards um, of our healthcare dollars, you know, no matter what country that we're at. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's why the, the rigorous evaluation process for any patient that's been through it, evaluating both, you know, medical history as far and as well as social and financial, you know, history and caregiver support, um, is incredibly important, you know, because we can put in these very expensive devices, but if someone doesn't have the resources, you know, both social, financial, or even emotional or, or, or physical to be able to handle um, these advanced therapies, then we really have 
done the patient a disservice as well as our health systems. So, you know, although LVADs improve survival and quality of life, which we've talked about, they substantially increase lifetime costs compared with optimal medical therapy or optimal medical management. So we, you know, as healthcare providers need to be, you know, judicious um, with the selection of patients uh, and be very open and, and upfront with some of these costs. Thank you very much. It seems like, um, you know, we're treating not only the patient, uh, but the patient and their family, because the family play a really crucial role in this, um, in this therapy. Uh, gentlemen, I'd like to thank you, uh, Dr. David McGiffin from Australia, uh, Jason Guichard from South Carolina, and Dr. Ahmed here in town, Birmingham. Thank you very much. Have a great day. To learn more from our team of cardiologists, please visit us at myheart.net. You can also follow us on social media by searching myheart.net on Facebook and Twitter. And be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss our next episode.